All right, welcome back to E75. This is lecture 10, so only 10, 11, and 12 left. Then we take a little hiatus, and then we come back in late December for the CS75, CS7 uh, fair. Um, so uh, yes, uh, let me just fess up. I'm kind of a walking advertisement for this other course, so store.cs50.net. Um, I'm not sure if clothing would appeal as much to this particular class, though we are pretty large too, but maybe we'll do that some other day. Um, so today is about design. So we continue our discussion of Ajax. And I did fix the shortcoming in Shuttleboy that I promised I would, because it was very much a hack with the meta refresh tag. Um, and today's meant to be a discussion about design with an eye toward final projects. So one of the hardest things, or one of the most interesting or challenging things for come final projects is you know, where do you begin? If you've got a vision of some project in mind, a lot of students, especially those with lesser backgrounds coming into the course, aren't quite sure where to begin since we've not handed you a PDF telling you where to begin. So I thought we'd use some of the apps that we've been discussing over the course of this semester that focus on Harvard-specific data sets to ask some questions. How should you design your table? Um, to uh, debate them in part, and then to look at some of the source code that we ourselves have been using underneath the hood for a couple of these apps. And the hope is, one, to get you thinking yourself about how you might tackle similar problems, and also just to take a look underneath the hood at some websites that have been using precisely the technologies and tricks that we've been talking about all semester. So with that said, let me somewhat dramatically dim the lights just for the projector and camera's sake. And this is actually it in the way of slides. So <laughs> that's the only slide for today. It's all hands-on. It's all code. And it's all web stuff. So hopefully more fun nonetheless. Um, and tonight will probably be shorter. Um, Anyway, just once we dive into a couple of websites, we'll see that where the conversation takes us. So I thought we'd look at this one first. So there is no food.cs50.net. And again, that's the domain we tend to use for most of these apps. But we've been using them, obviously, in discussion this semester as well. So food.cs50.net is actually just an API. So we looked at this in part last week. If you go to food.cs50.net, you're automatically redirected to that course's wiki, which finally, this was on my to-do list last week too, is documented and explains exactly how you can interact with this API. So what was the motivation here, just to recap the problem? So we have a bunch of students in that class, and maybe less so in this class, because odds are most of the adults in this class really couldn't care less what's being served in the dining halls. But for undergrads, it's a more compelling problem. But the data that we're going to be grabbing is structured in a way that's compelling for whatever your project motivation might be. So we have this website dining.harvard.edu, you know, some undergrads like to click on things like breakfast, and then they see what's for, bre or they see nutritional content. If I click this link, now I just kind of get a tabular list of what's for breakfast. And as I said last week, it's actually a pretty user-friendly site. In fact, there's nutritional information on there. You can, like, add things to a shopping cart and then get a full-fledged nutrition report. So they've actually done a nice job. And as best I can tell, this is some third-party product that they're using, because when I was trying to figure out how it works underneath the hood, I actually found some other universities dining services that had websites that look strikingly familiar or similar. So um, that was good because at first I realized, oh, well, if a third party has done this, very common in commercial products is some kind of API or standard way of interfacing with the data. So to be honest, I started trolling around Google trying to find hidden features of this website that they're using or the product that they're using, hoping that there would be a foo.x uh, foo.xml file or equivalent where I could just get the data. Well, that proved not to be the case. As much as I Googled around, I couldn't find any sort of fancy feature that would just hand me the data, a la Yahoo Finance in CSV format or RSS or XML, all of the things that we've come to realize are pretty easy to parse. So what this was an example of in my mind was screen scraping. And it was actually the first time I'd ever had to resort to screen scraping, because these days, you know, almost anything, uh, many, many, many more data sets are machine readable. But I decided I should start practicing what I preach. Let me get my hands dirty with this. And so what I thought we'd do today is not just talk about it at a high level, but actually look at some of the source code. And I happened to write it in PHP. I wrote it using what's called a cron job, which again is a script that gets run every hour, every minute, every day, whatever you configure it. And as you'll see, it's like this much code in a terminal font. So you know, 30, 40, 50 lines of code, not all that much. And what's really neat for our purposes is that it will allow us to look a little bit at using XPath. We'll actually have to introduce briefly a new topic called namespaces, which is a detail of XML that we largely was, were able to annoy, uh, ignore. But now it's a bit annoying because dealing with namespaces in PHP's 
simple XML API, it's actually not all that user friendly. It's kind of a pain. So let me try to save you some future headaches by sharing with you what、uh, the walls I banged my head against with that. So here's how I began. And the point of this is not to get you to care at all about the dining services website, because odds are you'll never have to look at this again, but really to give you a mental model for how you would tackle a similar problem, which was someone's got some data set、uh, you would like to incorporate into your own product or project for whatever reason. And so you need to figure out how this site works underneath the hood. And what's really cool, too, and which is why I actually think these are fun examples to look at, is、um, we will use for the next couple minutes the same tools like Live HTTP headers and Firebug to actually understand or reverse engineer, if you will, this website and infer what's going on. Because unfortunately, these days,、um, there's so much dynamism in some websites between AJAX and JavaScript that it's not quite sufficient just to look at the source code and realize, oh, that's how. Oh, they're doing it. They're, it's a little more nuanced. So I looked here and recall last week one of the takeaways I had was oh, I love URLs that look like this, right? Kind of a geeky thing to say, but this is a GET request. It's a URL. Looks like this is a Microsoft app platform because I see .asp, but whatever. I don't care about that detail because I'm only going to interface with it via the web. Notice that the date parameter is pretty juicy because that means I can presumably query for arbitrary data. Can get a little ahead of the curve and get the next day, the next week's menus.、Uh, looks like type equals 30. I actually don't know what that is, and to this day, I, I still don't know, but it's some kind of constant in their database that appears to say, give me the whole menu. So that's good. And I played around with different values, as, as you might too, trial and error, and things start to appear and disappear. And then I eventually realized that meal equals zero is breakfast, meal equals one is lunch, and <laughs> very good class, and meal equals two is. Is dinner. So again, this was pure trial and error because I was just kind of curious. So let's just make this more real. Let me go here and change this to meal equals two and watch over here. Let's hit enter. Come on. There we go. A little slow. And actually, let me turn off wireless so that it doesn't get interrupted. OK, a y I have my cable down here. OK, a y so that seems to be, that's a good starting point because now I know there's three different URLs that I'll have to query one for breakfast, one for lunch, one for dinner, and I'm going to have to query each of those URLs once per day. So I made an arbitrary design decision that、oh, I'm going to get today's menu tomorrow and like the next week because no, you're really kind of obsessive if you care what's for lunch like、oh, two weeks from now. So one week seemed reasonable. Plus, even though we don't do this ourselves, once you have future data, you get some interesting applications. Like I can be told on Monday when people Pizza is coming up on the menu. So I you know, rearrange my schedule accordingly. So seeing into the future lends itself to some interesting applications. So、um, what I then did was a little sanity check. Can I go that far? So here we are on、uh, November 23rd. Let me try November 24th. OK, a y that seems to work. Notice the date in the middle of the page changed. Let me try November 25th. Let me try November 26th. OK, a y so actually, this will be a good test. Our API has not been tested on holidays yet. So hopefully, this Thursday, my code won't break. So we shall see. And then let's skip ahead to like 12.01. OK, a y so we're pretty far into the future now. Let me try 12. OK, a y so at some point, the menu starts to disappear. So, presumably, even dining services d o e s n t know or d o e s n t publish what data they have. So, again, interesting data point for me to realize because I can't just do this once at the start of the year and just trust it's going to be the same. Going to have to run like a cron job to keep myself updated. So, if we go back to the current day, I then needed to understand the structure of the site. And what data, if you were trying to write a screen scraper, would you probably care about keeping around? What fields? Starting to think now about database design. What's at the menu item? So these things on the left in red turkey sausage, egg beaters, egg whites, and all of that. So I need that. What else might you care about? Just so we can focus on a specific、categories. piece. Sorry?、Categories. So categories. So these words in bold breakfast meats, breakfast entrees, we'll call those categories. It'd kind of be nice to retain that information.、Uh, anything else? What's that? Type of meal. So the type of meal. Oh, so breakfast, lunch, dinner? Oh, the legend. Yeah, so they use some horrible GIF that they shrunk down. That's not actually text. So it says vegan,、uh, vegetarian, Molly Kotzen, which was a new word for me. I had to Google that. 
local and organic. So there's a legend. It'd be nice to maintain these attributes. And we'll see in a moment that actually lends itself to an interesting database design so that we can avoid redundancies, ideally. Then there's portion and nutrition stuff. And I decided、eh, if the students are using this data, it's not so much because they care about the nutrition, it's probably they care about what and when. So we only for now focused on that. So, how to do it? Well, we looked at this last week, recall. I used my little friend Firebug. I right clicked on、uh, turkey sausage and then inspect elements. And if you've not gotten into this habit yet, honestly, this is by far one of the best free tools out there for web development. You see a nicely formatted、uh, DOM structure here on the left, and we see all the CSS stuff on the right. Odds are I don't care now about the CSS, just about the structure. And what was the, what was the aspect of structure that really caught our eye last week? Yeah, the class. So, notice that this block of blue text here, this anchor tag, inside of which is turkey sausage, is inside a span, which is inside a div. But what's neat is that this div just so happens to have a class associated with it. Now, maybe this isn't going to be true for all of the food on the menu, but feels pretty likely that this is helping distinguish food from just other data on the page. So, let's, let's test this hypothesis. Scrolling down,、uh, I've got more. Uh, let's see, let's jump to egg beaters. Let me just inspect that directly. So, this egg beaters 2 is inside of an item wrap. Let me、uh, go to egg whites now by choosing inspect elements. It too is an item wrap. So, we seem to have found a pattern. Now, huge disclaimer what we're about to do could break under what circumstances? They changed their code. Now, the upside, or what mitigates that, at least in this case, is this is a third party product. And most third party products, especially if they've been installed locally, tend not to be changed significantly. Like Facebook is very rare in that they're constantly overhauling their sites. Most sites are pretty constant week to week, month to month, and God, even,、uh, God forbid, year to year. So that's working in my favor. Otherwise, I'm going to have to play a little cat and mouse game and try to keep up with their changes. Yeah. So, I forget, you know, I forget offhand. I think I look through the source code and there's mention of some product name, and I actually forget the name.、Uh, this is the source code here scripts Food Pro. I saw this host name underneath the hood,、uh, Food Pro, and I Googled that, and that led me to like foodpro.something.edu as well. So. No, just inference or just a hunch. And in fact, there it is right there in the URL. It's like Food Pro. That's very specific. That must mean a brand name or something. And it was. If I Googled around, I found it elsewhere. So it didn't prove useful in my case. I was hoping I would find their documentation online. They would tell me, here's how you get the data in XML format. Maybe it exists, but who knows? I just decided, fine, I'm going to resort to screen scraping because it's a good exercise anyway. So now we have some kind of pattern. We seem to have some kind of tree, which is great because if I have XHTML, I therefore have XML. Which means I can use that query language. So, those of you who already came to the course with familiarity with regular expressions know that we could use pregmatch or something similar and use regular expressions to find this data. But I would offer、uh, for consideration that it's going to be a much bigger pain to actually pattern match on this using just regular expressions, if only because of the syntactic headaches of doing so. Absolutely can do it. And that's sort of the old fashioned way, if you will, of doing it. But XPath, as you'll see, is really compelling. And so this was great. So I copied and highlighted this. And as we did last week, I went to validator.w3.org. And then I was so disenchanted when I pasted in that URL, and damn. It's not valid transitional. In fact, that could mean that there's some errors, not of validity, but also of, well, formedness. Now, scrolling down, it actually looks like they just forgot to put everything in a C data section. Unfortunately, I have no control over their code. I can't just go fix that for them. Or can I? Well, remember last week I mentioned this thing. So, lib,、uh, let's just call it tidy. Tidy is a SourceForge project that I had previously only used at the command line, but it turns out they now have library versions of it for various languages, PHP among them. So I used my various、uh, Linux specific tools like yum to install Tidy on the particular CentOS machine that I'm running my code on currently. And long story short, I then had access to functions with which I could、uh, provide、uh, non imperfect XHTML as input and get as output. Perfect XHTML, or at least the program's best guess as to how that code should be fixed so that it's XHTML compliant. So here's where, that's where the story left off that last week. Now let's dive in and take a peek at some actual code. So I'm in a, an account here. 
where I'm in foo.cs50.net in a bin directory. I just chose a convention there of putting everything in the binary directory. And here's the script, fetch. And understanding each and every line of this isn't necessarily so important, but let me shrink my font just a little bit for a moment. It's not all that long. That's it. So it's three screenfuls. So 60 lines of code or so. And all of, almost all of them should be familiar. So let's take a look. So first, I have this configuration file. And inside of that is just my database's name and username and password. And I'm just using MySQL Connect to connect to a local MySQL database. So we'll look at the tables in just a moment. So up at top, these lines of code here for today, not so interesting. I just also uh, wrote this script in such a way that it supports command line arguments. I realized in advance that I might screw up. I might need to run this command not every night, but on demand if I need to update it or fix it. So these first couple of lines where it says get start and end dates, that's just to allow me to write a command line argument and say go get this specific date. But by default, if you uh, read the subtlety here, you'll see this. Uh, this syntax of having a parenthetical followed by a question mark followed by a colon means what? in PHP and in other languages. If else. So this is a ternary operator. What this first line means is store in the variable called SD for start date. If this expression is true, so if there's a string in argv bracket 1, then what do I do? The first thing or the second thing? So the first thing. It's literally just an if else. So I call get date stir to time of argv1. And incidentally, you don't need to scribble notes on this. We'll, we'll probably post the code online so you can play with it and use code like it for your final projects. So stir to time, if you've not used it, is a wonderfully useful function in PHP. It accepts so many different inputs like uh, 12 slash 25 slash 2009 or 25 space December space 2009 or many different variants of dates and times. You hand it one of those strings and it hands you back a Unix timestamp that corresponds to that string. It's a wonderfully handy tool because you don't have to parse the date and time yourself. It makes its best effort to figure out based on human conventions what the date and times fields represent and then it does the conversion for you. So this means I can just write at the command line almost any type of date but preferably something simple like 2009-12-25, some date like that. But that's what stir to time does for me. And get date meanwhile is a PHP function that returns various fields for that time. It can returns this structure if you've not used this. You probably use the date function by now but the get date function function, though slightly confusingly named, returns a structure, uh, an array or an object containing these fields. And this is relevant only because Harvard has this tradition of having brunch on Sundays instead of lunch, and I needed to be able to tell if a date was Sunday or any other day of the week. And so W day here, numeric representation of the day of the week, zero for Sunday through six for Saturday, I just needed that piece of data. And I could figure this out by you know, analyzing the date and time, figuring out what January 1st, 1970 was, but why bother? I can use a function for that. So long story short, by the end of these two lines of code, I have a start date, which by default is today, per this else clause. And then this is another cool trick with stir to time. You can input relative dates. So this line of code here, which also executes by default, says uh, the end date, dollar sign ed, should be the current time, which is captured in this variable here, plus six days. So it understands relative times like that. So it's very loosey-goosey when it comes to converting things to timestamps. And that's good for me, because two lines of code, I now have two variables, one of which represents now, one of which represents six days hence. And I didn't have to even think about it at all, what the current date is. So now what do I do? I iterate over dates. So essentially, this loop here is meant to induce an iteration of that goes six times or seven times from now until six days hence. So that's all this loop is set up to do. And I use some similar clever syntax because I don't want to think about taking a date, like again, 2009, uh, 25, 12-25. I could just increment the 25 to do it 26. But then what happens if I get to December 30th? Or is there a December 31st? Or what comes after that? All of a sudden, now I, again, have to care about what the boundaries are between months and such. So this relative trick of doing stir to time plus one day does it for me. I don't need to know if this is a leap year or anything crazy like that. So what comes next? So now, I just the goal, ultimately, is to generate a URL that looks like this. And to do that, I need to create a date like this for today, for tomorrow, for dot, 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 six days hence. So that's simply the first goal here. And so what do I do? Well, I can very easily get today's date in that format. 
So I looked up the date function's php.net manual page, and it's n hyphen j hyphen y gives me precisely that format. Then I want to get um, today's date in a different format, and you'll see why in just a moment. So this format is actually reversed. Y, 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 M, M, D, D. And that's actually going to be for my database, as you'll see, where I want to insert into a SQL table the proper uh, format. And then finally, I do this. I want to determine for this particular day, is it Sunday? Because if so, Harvard only has brunch and dinner. Harvard kind of did away with hot breakfast this year, uh, financial reasons. And then if it's any other day of the week, then there are actually three meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So once I have that, I can now begin my screen scraping process. But first, any questions? Any questions? OK. So first, I fetch the day's meals. And this is a little messy because of the font size now. But I'm calling this new function, tidy parse file, which does two things. It fetches a URL, and then it cleans it up as best it can. It takes in some sloppy XHTML, and ideally it returns a string containing nearly equivalent XHTML, but that's been cleaned up. Any open tags have been closed if they weren't before. Any attributes, values that weren't quoted are now quoted, and it fixes mistakes like that. And I pass it a couple of parameters. A common way of passing in a variable number of parameters to a function in PHP, just like Perl, is to pass in an array as an argument and then use an associative array. So this syntax, which you might not have seen before, is a way of constructing essentially a hash table on the fly, an anonymous one that has a key called numeric entities and a value of true, and then another key called output XHTML and a value of true. And I just read those off of the documentation for the tidy page that I pulled up on SourceForge before. So that says return XHTML to me and not HTML or something like that. And it means, uh, it says use numeric entities. Because I'm using XML, Recall, it's very subtle back then, but there's only five predefined named entities in XHTML, like less than, greater than, quote, uh, ampersand, and double quote, I think. NBSP, for instance, is not valid. And any, uh, um, uh, any number of other named entities that you've used, ampersand copyright semicolon, not valid XML. So I'm using numeric entities because I need XML. I don't need XHTML per se because I'm about to use XPath. So what comes next? Now that I have this variable called tidy, the function that actually makes the cleaning happen is called clean repair. That just fixes the string that's inside the tidy object. And then finally, I do this. So I actually cast it back to a string, because tidy, long story short, is actually an object. But if I, pass, if I cast it to a string, a uh, sort of secret function called toString gets called. And that actually returns the string representation of that object to me and stores it in a variable called XHTML. So at this point in the story, what I have is ideally a variable called XHTML that has the source code for that web page that I dynamically generated, but it's been cleaned up. And which web page is it? Well, notice the URL. I copied and pasted that from my browser. And although it's wrapping, notice there's two fields I plugged in dynamically, which are what? Yeah, so date and meal. Yeah, and I'm using the curly brace notation so that I actually ensure that the, th uh, the variables are getting interpolated inside of the double quotes. But I'm just constructing dynamically the string that we already realized could be constructed in this way. It's just a get string. Yeah. Um, so the tidy parse file and the clean repair mm -hmm. are available because you downloaded tidy? Correct. So, so I downloaded it, installed it, set it up on the server. It was relatively simple. Um, and then it just works for me. And if you find, if you want to use something like this on your own server or on CS75.net and you get something like uh, tidy parse file not defined or not found, just means that server doesn't have it installed. So you can either contact us or uh, Google around for your own server as to how to enable that PHP feature. But this tidy library exists for other languages as well. Yeah? I was going to ask one of the same question. I actually was looking for, for some other reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. True. So does that mean that on the CS75 server, if it says that there's a special requirement, most likely it's not there? Or? Uh, it depends. So we, so we on CS75.net use that panel called Direct Admin. 
Directed Min is great in that it's very cross-platform. You can use it on CentOS, Ubuntu, and other Linux distributions, but it's bad in that it doesn't use the built-in systems like apt or apt-get or yum. It instead compiles everything from source. This makes it very portable, but very annoying to add features. So anytime we enable features on CS75.net, we actually recompile PHP from source, which is why we tend not to do it that often. Um, so in, in a case of a non-direct admin system, usually fixing a problem like this is as simple as running something like yum install php tidy or some command like that or apt get install php tidy. It depends on your system if you need to enable support. So short answer is it depends. Depends. Any other questions? OK, so at this point in the story, we fixed the messiness that was that actual source code. So now the only challenge that remains is to grab the data we want and to insert it into a database. So the two questions are how to grab it and two, where to put it. What is our database design going to be? Well, let's see what fields we can pull out. And this is the headache that you run into with XML namespaces. So XML, na well, actually, why don't I put the question to the crowd? What is an XML namespace? Anyone know? I hear someone whispering. OK, so a namespace, these things exist in programming languages too. And jo many of you know Java. So Java package is an implementation of this idea of a namespace. If you put your code or your variables in a package, that means you can have variables and functions called foobar and baz, but so can someone else because their code was written in a separate package, in a separate name space. So same idea here in XML. Um, it's very reasonable for two people to want to use an element called foo, um, or maybe a, a more common name like title. Right? XHTML has a title, has a tag called title, but so do a lot of other XML-based languages. And it's important sometimes to be able to distinguish a title from an XHTML document versus an RSS document versus my own proprietary format. So namespaces allow you to do this as well. And in fact, even though you've perhaps been taking it for granted all this time, if you look at the source code for an uh, XHTML page, you have the doc type at the top of the page, but then you have this thing, which you've been forced perhaps blindly to include all semester long. XMLNS, which stands for namespace, equals this. So this is a URL, but this is just a convention. That URL does not actually need to lead anywhere. That can be a complete file not found response if you go to that. But the world decided that the way that we in XML will identify package names is to um, expect uh, that people use URLs. The idea being that you should only use a URL for the domain name you own. So Java people do the same thing. They'll uh, create a package called edu.harvard.foo.whatever. And that's because if we all arbitrarily choose this convention of using in our package names or namespaces domain names we own, what problem do we avoid? Collisions, right? It's just an arbitrary convention because only if some jerk decides to name his package the same thing as edu.harvard.foo.whatever will we have a collision. So we just kind of leverage this middleman, GoDaddy and the like, that says, so that we assume that we just use packages for domains uh, using domain names we own. But it's completely a convention. It's nothing technical. So what this attribute, XMLNS, says to the browser is any tag in this file should be assumed to be in this namespace. And that allows me to also, in the same file, to actually include other tags from other namespaces altogether. In fact, if you've ever looked at an RSS feed for a podcast, let me go to cs75.tv, which is where we keep uh, previous semester's videos. And we also keep this RSS link for the podcast. So this is a convention Apple came up with. I'm going to go ahead and open this RSS file. No, uh, Safari is rendering it. Let me go ahead and download this RSS file so that we can actually look at it. I'm going to go ahead and open this thing here in just a text editor. And you'll see some RSS that we wrote. So Apple, a few years ago, decided, eh, we're not going to bother coming up with our own format. We're going to use RSS. But there's some new data we need to add to RSS feeds, like the duration of a video and the author of a video, copyright information. So the means by which they, and this is very common, did this is they just augmented RSS with some tags of their own. But they put their tags in their own namespace so that they're not violating the definition of the RSS file format. So you can see this. At the very top, we have an RSS uh, root element. Below that, we have a channel element, title, and some familiar stuff. Then at some point, we get these crazy looking tags, which have iTunes colon, 
then a name. So iTunes in colon is the prefix, and then the tag name is the thing after the colon. So what does this mean exactly? Well, notice the very top of the file in the RSS element, there's another attribute. It's not XMLNS. It's XMLNS colon keyword, and then the URL after the equal sign. So that's XML syntax decided by the W3C that says that any time you see henceforth a tag prefixed with iTunes colon, assume that it's not in the default namespace, RSS is, it's instead in that namespace. Now what this means is when a computer program like iTunes or my own script reads in a file like this, I can distinguish iTunes's category tag from RSS's category tag and the like. So it allows you to co-mingle identically named tags in just one document. Now this is a wonderfully useful idea. PHP, frankly, kind of screwed up when it came to the implementation of this. It's much harder than it should be in PHP to parse this stuff. And so that's the code you're about to see. So how do I get at those tags that I was eager to get at? Well, we do this trick here. One, I pick up where I left off. In $XHTML is the source code of this page. All right, next. I load this just as you did weeks ago for project one into a DOM by using simple XML load string. It takes a string, returns to me a tree in memory. That's good because now I can start to use XPath. Well, what do I do first though? I first register a namespace and I do this as follows. I know what's inside this DOM because I know it's XHTML. So I'm going to register a prefix called XHTML and then with this namespace URL. Now I could have literally said foo but I was being a little anal and so I decided I'm actually going to call this XHTML. I could just call it F. The point is just to choose a keyword for the sake of my XPath queries in a moment. So now I've associated that namespace with that prefix. So here's what my XPath must now become. My goal is to get all of the TRs, the table rows, in the menu because each of those food items is in a TR and inside of that is that div with the item menu class or menu item class. So I do somewhat familiar syntax. Dom do, uh, arrow xpath slash slash means what? Search anywhere in the document. And I'm being a little lazy but the reality is the menu comprises in this case almost uh, the, composes almost the whole page and so yes I'm telling it to exhaustively search the whole page but I kind of need to do that anyway to get the whole menu. So that was a reasonable um, corner for me to cut but I could have been more anal and said slash HTML slash body slash whatever. Okay and here's the one difference. Now I have an XHTML colon prefix and what element is this returning to me? Perhaps needless to say. There's a form. So in fact, this whole nutritional website actually is embedded in a form. So I decided to leverage that. So I was targeting as narrowly defined a point in the page. So give me that form. And then in English, what does this predicate mean here? OK, the form whose attribute is uh, whose uh, ID attribute equals report form. And I figured this out again, trial and error. I used some firebug. I went up to like the top of this form up here. And then I noticed, OK, oh, there's the form element. Ah, an ID, even better, because now I can really uniquely identify that thing. So I see this in the bottom left of Firebug's output. So I targeted that. Then I went back to here to my code and said, OK, that gives me the right form element. What does this give me? This gives me the table inside. And this gives me an array of every TR element within. So pretty similar to what you did weeks ago. But now I'm parsing actual XHTML pages. So now at this point in the story, to be clear, what is inside of this variable, dollar sign TRS? An array of, yeah, an array of table rows from the document. So now it's just kind of logic. I now need to iterate over this, but I need to extract the data I care about. So I am actually going to deploy some regular expressions, but what's nice now is my regular expressions are only looking at a single row in the table. I'm not coming up with some gargantuan regular expression that's meant to analyze the whole page at once, and that's where things would get messy otherwise. So here we go. I'm going to first get the categories, and I, I'm going to wave my hands at some of these details because one of the interesting logical challenges was that notice that the category is not associated with every row. It's associated with every cluster of rows. So I just had to think through sort of CS1 style. How do I associate this category with every food below it up until this point, breakfast bakery, at which point I need to reset which category they're all in. So that's really just sort of programming 101. So I'm going to wave my hand at that. It's not easy, but it's sort of beyond sort of a before the scope of this course, shall we say. All right, so I have a variable called category that's keeping track of that guy. We're going to focus on the food items. So here we go. This is 
Uh, at this point, I am not a, getting a category. I'm actually getting a food item. And as you may recall, inside of a table row is a table data. But then there's that div. So a div who has a span, who has an anchor tag. So in fact, even though I initially targeted the menu item, it turns out that it was a lot easier for me to target the form and then inside of that just the whole table, because it turns out the only thing in that table were each of these rows with the menu items. And in fact, there's only one, where did it go? There's only one TD. Uh, inside each TD, there's a, one div, one span, and one anchor tag. So that actually gives me what in the file? Well, let's take a look back here. This is. Let's pull up turkey sausage. Whoops. Let, whoops. Whoops. Let's pull up turkey sausage in Firebug. And now notice I'm almost there. This is the, your, uh, this is the tag that I'm currently focused on. But what piece of data do I probably want to extract here? So the word turkey sausage. So that's kind of good because now notice there's kind of some, cent uh, there's some markers here, angled bracket, Angle bracket feels like I could probably leverage that. But if I'm diving into the anchor tag itself, I already have access to that information. And in fact, there's something else I probably want to keep around. What number do you think uniquely identifies this food item? Recipe. It turns out, and this was inference at the time, all the food items that Harvard serves up have unique IDs. And I figured, mm, mm, let me keep that around, because then I can come up with a better database design, which we'll glance at in conclusion in just a moment. So how do I get at the anchor tag? So I get the anchor tag very easily with the simple XML API. So it's very nice and straightforward. And then I do a sanity check. It turns out that sometimes they had some blank rows. So I filter those out by just checking if there's nothing inside this anchor. Ugh, skip this. It's uninteresting for us. And then here's a very simple regular expression, much, much simpler than it would have needed to be had I used regular expressions for the whole screen scraping process. So that regular expression says what in English? I'm comparing it against dollar sign a quote unquote href, which is the href attribute. So what is this regular expression doing for me besides determining recipe, which is a little vague? It's looking for? Good. So it's looking for recipe and its value. And rec notice what does the XHTML, uh, rather, what does the XHTML look like? It looks like there is uh, this URL inside of href. Then at some point it says RECIPE equal sign. Then a bunch of numbers. Then what? Ampersand. So a regular expression that suffices here is search that URL for the word RECIPE equal sign. And then what does this denote in parentheses? Digits, one or more decimal digits, 0 through 9. And the parentheses do what for me? Save it to memory. They're capturing parentheses, which means not only detect one or more digits, also store it in a variable. What variable? Into the third argument of preg match. So now inside of dollar sign underscore dollar sign matches, I have exactly what's been captured. So when people talk about using regular expressions, they sometimes mean they're using them to validate, which you've done whether in PHP or JavaScript or have been doing. But you can also do it to extract pieces of information. It doesn't have to just be a Boolean response. You can actually extract data. And here's a very simple case of that. So now, matches by convention actually is an array. It's not a single variable. But in the location one of that variable, you get the first match that it found. So I'm storing that match in dollar sign recipe. So now, and this is a little teaser, and we'll ask the, the schema questions in just a moment. Now we just have to execute a SQL query. So I'm going to insert into a table that apparently I called items two things, the recipe and an item, uh, specifically these string values. And then I take care to scrub the inputs just in case dining services has the word delete or something dangerous in their code. Anyone know what ignore means in this context? Case? Uh, not case. Duplicates. So it turns out that if I've defined one of these fields, recipe or item, to be a unique key or a primary key, that MySQL query will actually return false. And it could trigger an error. Because if you try to insert two things with the same uh, key value, if it's a unique key or a primary key, you will get an error. Insert ignore is my way of saying, I know this might be a duplicate because I'm doing this every damn day. I don't care about, uh, I won't be able to insert duplicates. 
Because we'll define the key to be on recipe, it should be unique. But this is my way of saying, let me try to reinsert recipes every day, even though I might have seen them before. This suppresses the warning, because ignore means ignore in cases of duplicates. So it's a way of embracing the fact that I know that this might already be in there. Alternatively, I could select, look for the recipe. If it's not there, do the insert. This has the same effect, and it all happens atomically. OK. It mm -hmm. Correct. So it does not insert the duplicate, and it also does not warn me that I tried to insert a duplicate. In short, it inserts it if it can, otherwise it shuts up and doesn't bother me. So it turns out after some thought that this whole idea of a legend, I wanted to store in a separate table. And let's actually come to that now. So now we have already seen, I've kind of spoiled the answer that I have a table called items, but what might the data types be? So I've got a table called items. I want to store a recipe number and also a the name of the item. So what schema would you propose? What structure do you want to see me have done in PHP MyAdmin? What should recipe be? Could be an integer, OK. So maybe an int. Oh, head shaking? No. OK, unsigned. I didn't see any negative values. And only trial and error could really confirm or deny if they use negative numbers. Feels a little weird. Does anyone want to push back on this idea of using an integer? Yeah. It would be possible they could use letters. It's possible. They could use letters. Haven't seen any yet, but that's very possible. And so if I want to kind of hedge against that, maybe I should just use what instead? Also, oh, maybe var chars. But there's a more damning concern that you actually trip over it. Uh, one trips over more often than not. You might have tripped over it in project, you might be tripping over it in project three with your import script. Yeah, so what if they have leading zeros? And I mentioned project three because what numbers have leading zeros sometimes? Like zip codes, 0, 2, 1, 3, 8. And in fact, if Excel has this very annoying habit that by default, if it reads numbers, OK, you've all experienced this, it hides the leading zeros. And then if you save that file, it literally removes the leading zeros. So even we, early on, when we were working on a map implementation, all of our data was actually, no, more real life story. When I was moving my life from Outlook into Gmail, I made the stupid mistake in Outlook of exporting my contacts from Microsoft Outlook into a CSV file. Then I opened it in Excel to glance at the data. I click Save As or whatever. I think I tweaked a few people's addresses manually. And damn it, I didn't realize that Excel took it upon itself to break every Massachusetts zip code that I had, almost all of which start with zero. So since then, over the past six months, anytime I pull up a friend in Gmail, I occasionally glance at their address and then manually add back a zero. Such a stupid thing. Anyhow, um, this is why I've been sort of uh, predisposed to use var chars unless I can be convinced that this is truly a numeric field. So at least in project three, if you've looked at the official PDF from zipcodes.com, they tell you what the data types are of the field. So that's good. And in fact, they tell you it's a five char, uh, five char field, not an int. So let's take a look then. So here's the table I went with. I called it items. Uh, this is the PHP MyAdmin. And in fact, this is the Browse tab. You can see that the scraper has been working now for some time. If I look at the structure of it, I went with a char of six. I got a little daring. I figured, mm, haven't seen any keys, uh, recipes that are longer than six characters. So I'm going to cross my fingers and hope I never do see it. But maybe this will break at some point. I could hedge and just use var char. And then for the item name, no one really calls their food something longer than 255 characters, so I just chose that somewhat arbitrarily. Now, as for keys, if I click details here, what do you hope to see? What would you propose? What's that? Primary key for recipe? Presumably, right? I, I don't have hard data to suggest this, and I didn't bother writing a script that analyzes every item on the menu to make sure this is true. Just felt instinctively that this makes sense. And in fact, that's what I did. I defined a recipe as a primary key, which means I can now expedite searches on this field, and I can also guarantee uniqueness. I won't insert duplicates automatically. And this is, again, a really nice feature of a database to impose constraints on your data so you don't have to trust yourself or maybe the developer with whom you're working if you're the database person. Any questions? OK, so then there was this trick. So notice now on this website, and we'll see what, if this can't tell us a little something about database design. Once in a while, the food items had this like vertical, whoops, had this vertical bar and then an icon. So this was mildly annoying, because now I have to figure out how to parse 
GIFs or JPEGs or whatever these are. And it looks like it doesn't happen on this day. Some days, there's actually two icons next to a food. So here's something that's organic and vegetarian uh, or vegan here. So now I have to somehow figure out what these are. So I right clicked. I looked at the DOM. And then, oh, it turns out that after the span and after the anchor tag, what is included in the XHTML for those properties? So they're images. It looks like there's an image. One is called uh, icon org. One is called icon vegan. And then the alt attribute, maybe that's really my, my keyword. And so I hopped on that. I wanted to exploit this. So if we look back at the source code, what trick would you propose I use or did use? <coughs> What's that? So looking at the alternate field. But programmatically, how did I get at that data? Well, if we take a look here, notice this. At this point, and this is another example of using axes and XPath from weeks ago. So notice at this point in the story, I'm iterating over, or rather, I have in a variable called $A the anchor tag that I cared about. But unfortunately, image is a sibling of the anchor tag, right? It's not a child, so I can't keep diving in deeper with the arrow operator. So how do I get at this data? Well, I can go back an element, then back an element, then dive in into the image tag. So I can go back up in the DOM and then back in. Feels a little efficient, inefficient, but I'm not going that, that, far, that far back, so it's actually OK. So now I can iterate over the zero or more image elements that follow this element here. And then I just have this separate table called legend that apparently has two fields, recipe and key. And then finally, I insert into this thing called menu all of the juicy details, the date of this meal, what it is, breakfast, lunch, or dinner, the category that I found, and the recipe. So that, the final design question is this. Why did I factor out this table called legend? And here's what it looks like. Let me go to the database. Here is the legend table. And here's what you have in this table. Recipe key, recipe key, recipe key. And it associates these various properties with all of the different recipes. And then the menu, to be clear, looks like this. So this is really what I cared about. I have a date field, a meal field, a category, and a recipe. So let's actually answer a couple of questions here. Why is item, the item's name not in this table? So it's in the recipe table, but why, OK, then I'll recursive argument here. Or why is it only in the recipe table? Because it feels like this would be so simple if I just had everything here. Like uh, the vegan or? Yeah. Not vegan, uh, the name of the item. So uh, the of turkey the sausage. Why is turkey sausage not in this table? Yes. OK, so that's true. But it's, I think that's answering the, the other question. Why aren't the properties? Why aren't vegan and vegetarian in this table? If we just focus on the name, why is the name of each item apparently not in this table? Because it could be. Could be. OK, so, normal, so I heard normalized in a couple of places. So what does it mean to normalize the table? Well, even this is a little inefficient because I'm still using chars, which means lookups on this table based on recipe still takes at least six operations, one, two, three, four, five, six, for each of the six characters. But turkey sausage is T-U-R-K-E-Y space S-A. I mean, already I'm exceeding the length of six. So if I had turkey sausage being served at multiple breakfasts, I'm going to have turkey sausage, turkey sausage, turkey sausage, again and again and again. And this is one of these opportunities for normalization. Why say anything twice if you can factor that out based on its unique key, its recipe ID, and put it elsewhere, thereby saving bytes and ultimately keeping your database much smaller. Yeah? So why do you have breakfast So that's a good question. And this was a conscious design decision. Um, can anyone answer that question for me? Why might I have done this? Because the recipe services. So the recipes are different. But if you look through here, You'll see, let's, uh, let's see if we can pick. Sorry? 
Yes, so that, that's partly it. So I just sorted by recipe so we could see duplicates in this table. So you see duplicates for different days. And I hypothesized, and this might not be, this might be an overly paranoid assumption. I hypothesize that some recipes can actually end up in different categories based on the day if they want to call it in the make your own uh, salad. Certainly there are certain ingredients that belong in different food items. So I didn't want things to break just because I was being super anal and trying to really normalize the heck out of the data. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to go uh, keep it safe, and I'm going to associate the idea of a category with a specific line item, not with the recipe itself. So it's clearly redundant here. And I could certainly factor out keywords like sandwich bar, and I could have a fourth table. But frankly, for a relatively small data set, there's only a couple hundred meals over the course of the year with a several dozen probably food items. I didn't want to over-engineer this problem because frankly there's a nice simplicity for me, the programmer, to be able to glance at my table and realize, oh, this is in the sandwich category, this is in the sandwich category. And so as much as we've preached in this course the idea of using unique IDs all over the place, it actually makes it a huge pain just from a user interface perspective to just look at your data sometimes. And so even for the course's website, we have this database of grades and whatnot, and we have a students table, we have a staff table, and originally in the version of the website we're running now, I practiced what we preach, and I used unique IDs for every student, unique IDs for every staffer, but it's such a pain for me to then use this GUI, PHP MyAdmin, to see what students are associated with which staff for grading purposes and whatnot. So actually in the new version of the website that we'll probably roll out um, next semester, we instead resorted to using usernames, which are 0 or to 8 characters. So it's definitely uh, less efficient than just using ints or small ints, but it's so much more human readable. So and that's one of the upsides that I think is reasonable with GUIs like PHP MyAdmin. They're not just about dumbing things down and avoiding you the uh, letting you avoid the command line. They themselves are management tools. And I have consciously not implemented a whole bunch of administrative features for the staff of the course because we just say, eh, go look at the database tables and tweak things there. So that, too, I would argue is a very reasonable design decision. This is one of those reasons here. OK, but why is the recipe name uh, not there? Well, I ver more reasonably assume that if you have a unique ID for a recipe, you're probably gonna not going to change its name. And if you do, the recipe is not going to stay the, not going to change. So that felt like there was a one-to-one -one relationship. And as for legend, same thing. If I want to associate one, zero or one or two or three icons, you could. And this is very common for, for neophytes when designing database tables. I might have a column for vegan. I might have a column for vegetarian, a column for organic. So I could have another five or six columns, one for each of the icons in that legend. But what's a downside of adding to the width of this table? Yeah, if they add some other new feature, like this is uh, carb-free or some other property, now I go in and change my database table. And if, you know, if over time they start to categorize things more and more, your table just starts to get really, really wide. And in fact, even that CSV file you're using from zipcodes.com, it's really wide, which is great for transportability, but not so much for user interface or for just keeping track of the data visually. So what I did here, to, and there's another downside. If I have all of these additional columns, but most items on the menu are not vegan, they're not vegetarian, they're just the opposite, what does that mean for my database's size? It's just wasting space. I have so many zero values or so many false values. So there's a trade off there too. So normalization. I factored out this legend table and I just need like a, two columns, right? The recipe and the key. And now I don't have to store the same property with the same recipe multiple times. Now, the downside here might be what? I'm making an assumption here. What's that? Well, so my queries now need to be more sophisticated. I need to use the join keyword if I want to merge this data back together. But what am I specifically assuming now, given that I've associated a key with a recipe ID and not with a line item in the menu? That that recipe is not going to change right. from vegan to vegetarian. Right. So I'm assuming now that those legend properties are fixed with regard to the recipe and that the recipe itself does not, like once in a while, they don't add meat to some non-meat product just because. So maybe that's a reasonable assumption because I figure recipe means recipe. Odds are I can look at the recipe and see if it's vegetarian or vegan or whatnot. But this too could break over time. And maybe I need to put things back into the menu table. You know,
someone goes through and says, oh, this is not really what it is, mm -hmm. then you're not really picking up corrections. Like if someone had, True. had um, chicken and peas, but they're doing chicken and spinach, and mm -hmm. they're just putting kind of peas in it. Mm -hmm. So, so very true. If the data set changes over time or the recipes change over time, I indeed might not notice it. And so that's actually a good spin for the whole storyline here, which is that eh, this is, you know, this is making do with real world data that I have no control over and might very well need to keep up with myself. So. Oh, sure, sure, absolutely. I could add uh, some more rigorous checking like that. OK, so at this point in the story, we're at the end of the script. I've done inserting into three tables. I also tried to be a good citizen, and I sleep for a second in between iterations, because I'm going to access a URL for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner, and then do it seven times total. I didn't want to hit them all at once, though frankly, 21 queries within the span of a second or two is really not such a big deal. Servers should be able to handle thousands at once. And odds are they're not thousands of undergrads checking what's for a meal uh, in any given second. But you know, good practice here, so that they don't blacklist me or just get annoyed at me. So be a good person. Question. Yeah. Uh, so the cron job updates all the three uh, tables. Mm -hmm. Well, the cron job just runs this script that we're looking at here. And it's this scripts for loop that iterates over breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then does it for each of the seven days. Other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, no, so, no, so if uh, what I'm doing is I'm iterating over each of the image elements. And so in this loop here, I'm inserting, albeit with the option to ignore, uh, each of the keys for each of the recipes. So I'll only insert vegan once for a given recipe ID or vegetarian once for a given recipe ID. But there's no clobbering of vegan over vegetarian or vice versa. Well, no, recipe is a primary key. But that's an item scale, Right, that's in a different table. So here it's what would be called, in the legend table, it's what would be called a foreign key, because it's a primary key that's being used elsewhere. And so this is OK in this case. Actually, that's a really good point. If I look at the structure of legend and then click on details, notice that I've declared, uh... oh, OK. I've declared it to be unique, but it's a joint unique key. So what I did to make this happen was I, in PHP my admin, I click this, I click this too, and then clicked unique. So I say this key and this recipe together define a unique key. And so that's the way of avoiding uh, insertion of duplication. So that's another s fancy, useful technique for ensuring database integrity at the database layer. Uh, in this case, no, because I never actually use it. But you know, why don't I, again, practice what we preach? And I'm going to say that this here should be indexed as well. So an index has been added. So I just executed this SQL. So this actually now makes my joins, which I do elsewhere in code that's less uh, interesting today, more efficient now, because I've told it to build an index. So what's the output of all this process? Well. Really, it could be anything. Now I have the data. I can do anything uh, with it that I want. But just to close the circle here, what we decided to do is re-expose the same data in precisely the format we ourselves wished it existed in the first place. So if I now go, here's again the documentation, which for us isn't so interesting, just the output here. If I go here, I see that, oh, I'm supposed to hit URLs of the form food.cs50.net slash search, question mark, date equals something, meal equals something, output equals output. And we decided to support three formats. And the formats are applicable or interesting for our purposes. It can either be CSV, JSON, or PHP, the latter of which you might not have seen before. So if you choose PH, uh, CSV, what a student or user of this API would get back is this, a CSV, each of whose columns represent pretty much the data in our database. And then over here, we do spit out all of these key values. And then we put sort of similar in spirit to the iCalendar format, uh, I, sorry, to calendaring software like Outlook, we spit out true or false, true or false, so that it's very clear which of those properties apply. It's not the most efficient encoding, but my god, this is so much easier for someone to parse, just like you did for project two 
than the hoops we had to jump through. If you instead request JSON, this is what pretty printed JSON code looks like. You get back an array per the square bracket of objects per the curly braces separated by commas, each of which contains the key and the value that we're providing to the user of this API. And then finally, in this part you might not have seen before, if I choose PHP, I get back this craziness. What is this? What's that? Yeah, they're kind of key value pairs. This is PHP's serialization of an object or an associative array. So it turns out that you can take an object or an associative array in PHP and actually transform it into a string, so long as you don't have any circularity or complex structures going on inside. If you just have an interesting object that's got some key value pairs and maybe some hierarchy, but again, no cycles, you can tell PHP to spit it out as one big string. You might do this for a couple of reasons. One, you want to transmit it over the internet, take a PHP object, turn it into a string, send it over HTTP, which is all string based, and then let someone like the user of this API convert it back automatically into a PHP object. Or sometimes you want to cache the data. So if you grab a piece of data from a server and you don't want to hit them again and again, you want to keep that answer around for some amount of time, you might want to take your own object, cache it to disk as a string, because files store strings and other data, and then you can reverse that process when you actually want to look in your cache again. And what PHP has for this purpose are two wonderfully useful functions. The serialize function takes in an argument, which is an object or an associative array, and it turns it into a string and returns that value. And unserialize does the opposite and returns to you the PHP object in memory. So why did we do this? This just means now that you can write PHP code that grabs this data, call unserialize, and bam, you have in memory precisely the same object we had in memory. And PHP, for those of you who are suddenly a little nervous, um, does not, for instance, uh, let you call if you're serializing an object and there are methods associated with the object, the methods don't get shipped across the wire. The class name does, so I would need to have the same class definition on my server, but things like constructors and other functions are not automatically called uh, by default, and this is to prevent me from sending someone an object that they just blindly avow and load into memory and then I delete their file system because they trusted an object from the internet. So there are some protections in place. For me, not applicable because I'm just shipping data across the wire. And so if you actually print R, print recursively that PHP object, you would see this which is the same data that's been sent across the wire. So again, shouldn't care and hopefully don't care what is on today's dining hall menu, but it's a wonderfully intricate example that ties in so many of the things we've been looking at. So why don't we take a five minute break and then we'll come back and conclude with a look at something more Ajaxy. All right, we are back. So recall last time we pulled up this site. This is the shuttle oriented site. And again, you shouldn't have to care when the Harvard shuttles are, but rather how the application was implemented. And I made this sort of quick and dirty uh, decision at the time. If you want to go from quad to say Mass Ave and Garden Street, which is a popular route, you'll get a table back like this and it shows you the shuttles from between now and the next 24 hours. But then I had this kind of hack in place with this 1990s style approach to dynamism, whereby I had a tag called meta refresh that would every 60 seconds force a reload of the whole page, which was wonderfully robust because it ensured that the table on the right hand side got refreshed once per minute. But what's the downside of this approach of using meta refresh, which is again just a tag in the head of your page that says refresh this whole page every n seconds? It refreshes the whole page, and okay, but why is that bad? Okay, good. So it's really a heavy-handed solution to updating like. A couple numbers and it's not necessarily just the first because most of these numbers or some of these numbers will change over time because we have certainly 11 minutes from now will become 10, 31 will become 30 but the image isn't changing and the text in the middle isn't changing so there's definitely a lot of static content so it's definitely wasteful and on a slow connection it's going to be annoying. You're going to get a flicker often where the whole page might go white for a split second then you get the page and even more annoying suppose I'm just a very nice user scrolling down and I'm, I'm focusing here and oh I grab a piece of paper and I start writing down the times, what's going to happen? It's going to refresh and then bam, like annoyance. So there's these downsides to the user interface that at the time were acceptable costs at whatever late hour it was where I just wanted to ship this. But I decided after 
committing to it on camera last week to actually solve this a little more robustly. But there's some interesting implications. So you might be inclined initially, ooh, use Ajax for this. But there were some features I wanted to preserve. And one of them is I wanted the URLs to be bookmarkable so that users could bookmark their favorite routes or put the little shortcuts in their taskbar or whatever it is in their browser. So if they only care about one route, they can bookmark this particular page. So I didn't use post for that reason. I only used get. And I also didn't want to resort to a very common approach these days, um, which is to use only AJAX to get the data, whereby the URL never changes at all. So it's very common, and case in point, maps.google.com, suppose I search for uh, 1 Oxford Street, Cambridge, Mass, watch the URL. What happened or didn't happen? So nothing, which means this is where my office, is, or this is where the Science Center is. I'm going to bookmark where I live. So I go sh add bookmark and uh, disappointment, because now all I get is the original Google.com. So there's the bookmark I just saved. So this is annoying. Now Google mitigates this in one way, which is what? If you want a deep link, as it's called, deep linking means go to a specific state of a page within a website. What do you do in Google Maps? Yeah, so they have this, which is kind of hackish, but it's also very robust, for, uh, which has some upsides and downs. If you click link, they say, oh, bookmark this URL. And they tell you, paste link in email or IM. So let me copy that. Let me paste that. And oh, now I have a, a real get string with a, a Q attribute, a source, geocode. Here's my query string. So this is actually. Um, very robust, and so when I hit enter, it even recenters the map right where I was because embedded in this URL, which might now be familiar from Project 3, are some GPS coordinates, latitude and longitude. So, what's the analysis here? Why is this good and bad, this approach that Google took? Okay, uh, certainly you can find fault with this. What's bad? Personal opinions, rants, anything. Uh, so it's a big URL. So it could line break in emails, which actually is a reasonable problem and unfortunate these days. So that's a downside that the URL they give me is pretty long. Right, this is why tiny URL and the equivalents these days are very much in vogue, part also because of Twitter and such. Yeah. could change the format of the string later. So th this is sort of a fundamental problem on the web. If someone changes the URLs around, you better use mod rewrite or whatever to try to redirect people, else they reach dead ends. And what, what's maybe the more damning one? Is think of the least technical person you know. Yeah, I mean, this is actually pretty reasonable from a UI perspective. I am used to bookmarking sites by going to my bookmark menu, or I'm used to emailing URLs by copying and pasting the URL string that I've gotten very familiar with. I don't think to look for a little icon that looks like a chain or an infinity sign, and then to click that, then copy paste that. Now, maybe the people in this room know that this you know, is increasingly common. YouTube does something similar and all of that. But you know, this is kind of a downside, but it's very robust, because the alternative in this world of Ajax, or you have two alternatives. One, you can reload the whole page and update the map accordingly. Then you're back in the days of MapQuest, version 1.1. And we can see this. So Google has a lot of people and a lot of money, so they can afford to implement the same product twice. If I go to disable JavaScript and then reload Google Maps, uh, your web browser is not fully supported by Google Maps. That's OK. I'm going to search for one. Oxford Street, no more autocomplete. I had to give that up with, a, uh, with JavaScript. Search Maps. There is a version of Google Maps you may have never seen. There's no drag and drop. You can drag and drop, but you're just going to drag a ping or an image or whatever. This is sort of their version of MapQuest, version 1.0. And they decided to implement this just in case people don't have JavaScript. Frankly, I don't envy the person or persons who had to do this, because it's like implementing a whole other website for like 1% of your population. Um, but you know there are big enough people, so one percent is a lot of users. So, anyhow, um, what's the alternative though? What's very common these days? Well, the alternative would be to use AJAX, and AJAX allows you, as you know and as you've seen, to update subsets of the page dynamically without reloading the whole page, even without changing the URL. So there is actually really a hack that the world has come up with over time to bookmark state or maintain state actually in the URL? And what's the key symbol that allows you to update the URL without changing the whole page? 
this symbol? What's the symbol for a fragment ID? Anyone know? Uh, not percent, close. Not tilde, not as close. <laughs> so, what's that? Pound sign or the sharp sign, yes, exactly. So you've seen these in web pages where if you've got a really long web page, you can actually have the page automatically scroll part way down by using these things called fragment IDs, where you bookmark a URL of the form, uh, oh, www.foo.com slash bar.html, sharp sign, middle. And this URL here will take you to bar.html and www.foo.com, but to the placeholder, the, the anchor tag, partway through the page, that happens to have been given a name called middle. How do you do this? Well, there's two pieces of this. You have really long page, dot, 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 and then you do something like this. A name equals middle, close A. And maybe you've never done this, in which case, here's a new HTML trick for the day. Then rest of page. So if you embed a link like this, it's not a hyperlink. It doesn't lead anywhere. It's a named anchor. What this means you can do is on some random website, you can embed this kind of link. A, a whoops, a href, da da da, dub dub dub, foo.com slash bar.html, sharp, middle, click me, that will lead me to bar.html, but to that position in the page. So this has been around since like the 1990s. And it's not terribly common, but it's definitely useful if you want to link to the uh, lower down on a page. Um, it's a pretty handy trick. So it has the effect, though, or rather the side effect of any time you visit an anchor, a fragment ID, you don't actually reload the whole page. You just scroll to a certain part of the page. And moreover, if you visit a fragment ID that doesn't exist on the page in this form, the URL gets updated, but the page doesn't move. It doesn't scroll. So you have this ability, it seems, to append information to a URL in such a way that it has no visible effect on the browser. And this is exactly our goal with Ajax, not to reload, not to scroll the whole page, but rather just to change the URL so that the user can bookmark it or so that the user can um, somehow maintain state in the URL. Yeah? An ID attribute will work as well. So it doesn't have to be the name feature. True. So why is this useful? Who cares? Well, consider our version, so our Harvard version of this map. So I've pulled this up before. This is a Google Mapified version of Harvard's campus. And I can't use uh, page reloads here if I want to maintain the, the model that is Google Maps. I don't want the whole page reloading 1990s style. So when I type something like Mather House and then choose this from the menu, I don't want the whole page to change because I want just the map to change and I want some results to appear, but I don't want to reload the whole thing. But I would really like, especially for a mapping application, to let users copy and paste that URL so that they can link to this. In fact, if I copy in that URL, then open up a new tab, blank window, and paste this URL, ideally, I don't want this to just go to maps.cs50.net. I want it to go to the state that I bookmarked. And so when I hit Enter, I get back the map and voila. My state has been maintained. Now, I just decided at the time that this was better than Google's approach. And I'm sure Google has technical reasons, though there's lots of different groups in Google. Gmail uses fragment IDs for Ajax, and a number of their other apps use fragment IDs for Ajax. Google Maps, for whatever historical or technical reasons, does not. They instead have that explicit link tag. But there are ways to do this, but frankly, to, um, I'll come to their defense, it's a pain in the neck implementing state by way of URLs these days because it's done different. You have to do it differently on all sorts of browsers. So the reality is you have to, have to, have to use some kind of library unless you want to hate yourself for having to jump through all of the requisite hoops on different browsers. So YUI has something called their browser history manager. jQuery has a bunch of plugins that implement things like this. Any number of libraries have similar features that allow you to maintain state after a sharp sign in the URL. Google Closure actually just released something similar, uh, or comes with something similar that I've been meaning to try, it came out a couple of weeks ago, that also does something similar. It allows you to maintain arbitrary state, random strings that you will decide mean something after the sharp symbol. And so that's what I'm using. I'm using Google's uh, browser history manager. It's probably the worst library in YUI. I hate it. And it's, I'm, it's being ripped out as soon as possible because the code is just so complex itself. And it's meant to simplify life. But what it has the upside of is this. Notice if we look closely at this URL, 
the URL itself never really changes, it, or what we think of as the URL. What actually is changing is everything after the sharp sign. So I decided that I would have the convention of a word search, equal sign, and then this stuff. So what is all of this stuff? This is actually a get string that's been encoded with ampersands and equal signs, parameters and values, but it just so happens to come after the percent sign. So what the YUI browser history manager happens to do is it has a little timer that goes off like every half second, and it's constantly monitoring the URL in the browser, which is document or window.location.href. And anytime it notices a change, it calls a function that I've registered with the library as an event handler, and my function is supposed to update the state of my map. So the upside is that so long as I update that URL, users can bookmark it. And even better, and this is what's huge in Ajax, I've just searched for Mather House. Let me now search for, let's say, LOL. Let me now search for Fortimer, so random buildings on campus. I'd really like the user's, no, oh, it doesn't work anymore, does it? Oh, no, it does. I'd really, no, it doesn't. Damn it, I hate this library. <laughs> OK, um, it will be fixed. But the point is the higher level purpose here. But it kind of worked, so it didn't quite work as planned. I want the back button to continue working. And this is one of the biggest downsides of using Ajax, Ajaxified applications these days. Very, very often do the back buttons break, partly because the developers just haven't built in support for a trick like this, and partly because it's, it's just a pain in the ass to get this to work right now. So this whole Ajax trend has really come onto the scene without full-fledged native support, and it's just a headache without using libraries. And even this library clearly is not quite, or me, are not quite doing what we should be to make this work properly. But at least bookmarking does in fact work. So any questions about fragment IDs or Ajax here? All right, so what was the takeaway? Well, we began with this promise of Ajaxifying this particular website. And notice it has been ticking down. Started at 13 minutes, now we're at seven minutes here. But I don't need to reload the whole page, but I do want to bookmark state. But a normal user does not need to bookmark the current date and time. They just need to bookmark the origin and the destination because the whole point of this website is to show you the shuttles now. And technically, there are hidden debugging features where I can bookmark any arbitrary date and time, but normal users don't care. And so this OK if I don't maintain state in the URL for the table itself. I don't need to know what the current time is. I will just get it from the system clock each time. So we can infer now how I solve this problem. So let me go ahead and open this up in Firefox instead where we can use the friendly uh, Firebug interface. And now let me go ahead and open up. Um, oh, wait, that's interesting. Didn't it just say seven minutes? What happened there? Is that a bug? I could have sworn it. We'll check the tape. All right. It did say seven. That's interesting. All right. 17. All right, I'll have to keep an eye on this. All right, so um, this is, uh, we won't show the source code to this one. All right, so how did we actually do this? Well, let's take a look at Firebug here. So first, let me check the server's date and time. So I'm going to run the date command on this Linux server. Looks like we have uh, 40 seconds or so until the next page reload or something like that. I'm going to focus on the net tab here. And let me clear this. And now what we're going to, oh good, actually the time, it's not perfectly synchronized with the minute hand, it just goes every uh, few seconds. Notice, oh that's what I did, every five seconds it actually pulls the server. And this was actually a conscious decision for two reasons. So one, the schedule does not change every five seconds, it changes every 60 seconds. But when I originally had it refreshing every 60 seconds, I ran into headaches whereby the, uh, the client's clock is not necessarily synchronized with the server's clock. And so sometimes just because of timing issues, it would jump a minute or you would miss a minute in its update, so I needed to refresh more often. I'm OK with refreshing every five or so seconds, because soon we'll be integrating Google Maps integration, where we show little moving markers that represent the buses moving on campus. And for that animation, we're going to have to pull the server every one or two or five seconds. So this is kind of a rationalization, but also kind of foresight for that feature. So notice I'm clearly hitting, somehow, with no hands on the keyboard, this URL, search.php, again and again. Well, what's really neat about Firebug 2 is it allows you to do some introspection. If I expand that first call, make my window bigger, first I see the headers, so the HTTP headers for the request on the left, 
uh, and the response. So response comes first, then the request in this convention here. Most of these are uninteresting, but it looks like what's coming back in the response is text HTML. So in previous classes, and even in the project, we've been preaching the virtues of JSON or XML. But there's other, that other approach from last week and two weeks ago of inner HTML and returning XHTML. And frankly, I find that I often find, and empirical uh, tests often confirm that the most efficient way sometimes is to generate your additional XHTML server side, ship it down to the browser, and then just cram that into the DOM by way of inner HTML. It tends to just work very well. The alternative would be I could send back this data in JSON format or XML format. And frankly, this table, if there's ever a cleaner data set of key value pairs, this is it. I could very easily uh, represent this in JSON or XML format. But then when I get the data, I have to have a big JavaScript loop that iterates over the JSON object or the XML. It creates new TRs for all of the data. It gets rid update, removes the old ones. It's just a lot of code. And I can do this so easily in PHP. So for certainly this application, it was a conscious design decision to just make the HTML on the server side, ship it to the browser, and just remove the old XHTML and plug in the new one. And the upside of Ajax is that this does, in fact, happen seamlessly. There's no flicker on the right-hand side. So what is this URL actually getting for me? Well, let's take a look at the most recent request. Let's take a look at the parameter list. Notice what's really nice about Firebug. It parses the whole URL. There's none of this scrolling left and right to see what's in the URL. There's three attributes, A, B, and output the value of which are quad, mass of garden street, and xhtml. So those are the things in the get string, uh, because the URL, to be clear, is this. In blue here, that is the Ajax URL that's being queried. Or rather, that is the URL that we're querying via Ajax. And if we look at the response, look at what I'm sending down. It's really just a big, updated table element. It's definitely verbose, right? XHTML is really not that succinct. And there's some CSS stylization in there so that at least I'm applying the same style sheet as I already downloaded. But it's just a bunch of HTML. And in fact, um, Firebug lets me click this HTML tab so I can see it. What I'm shipping down is just an unformatted uh, XHTML table. So I simply have some JavaScript then that upon receipt of this Ajax response, it grabs the uh, response text, which contains this XHTML, or even response XML would work. Uh, no, nope, response text, because I want the raw XHTML. And just like we did last week, I insert it into the inner HTML property of this div that's over here on the right-hand side. And that's the means by which I Ajaxified, as they say, this particular interface. And I'll address that apparent bug from before. but. Um, it's very seamless now, and there's no major page re, uh, refreshes. Now, what's a downside? Right? We never get anything for free when we make these new design decisions. What's the downside here? Mm, hint. Uh, ch -ch -ch. Let's clear that. You'll get a hint every five seconds. So there's a lot more requests. So this is one of the big trade-offs of Ajax, too. Now, instead of the user visiting once in a while based on human input, which tends to be relatively slow, now I kind of empowered my users to hammer my server or hit my server ad nauseum until they actually close this window. Now, the upside in my mind is that a student, especially one who's trying to keep an eye on the clock, can keep the web page open like this. And it will just they can always alt tab to it and quickly see when's the next shuttle. And it's always going to be current. They don't have to remember to reload. They won't get confused. So that's a good thing from a user interface. The price I pay is that it's updating itself right now every five seconds. Now, I could be smarter. I could do it every 60. I could get less data and just update the top few rows. There's many other design decisions I could make. But fundamentally, with Ajax, especially with websites that update themselves automatically like this, you're paying a price. So now I have one user hitting my server once every five seconds. Now if I have multiple students doing this at once, I now have multiple hits every several seconds. And it's very easy to cripple your own server by making poor decisions, especially since when you write JavaScript code that's using Ajax and the user downloads it, there is no taking it back. 
until they close the browser or refresh their cache of your JavaScript code. So when you ship JavaScript code, it's especially important if it's using AJAX that you not have like an infinite loop in that code or anything that's going to impose undue uh, load on your server. And we made this mistake last year. We used to have a tool for office hours whereby students could sign up for office hours via a website. Um, and in this way, were the staff able to keep an eye on the website and see, oh, this person is sitting down there in the, in the lab. Let me go help them next. Unfortunately, um, it was implemented with far too fast of a refresh rate. And we crippled our own server for like two weeks every time office hours happened until we, fixed, until we frankly went back to a whiteboard. Um, so that was not a very good version 1.0 of that tool. But it's very easy to do. And we brought down our own server by having a few dozen students using um, an AJAX piece of code simultaneously in a lab. Oh, it's a good question. Um, how does that actually happen? So on a typical web server, especially Linux boxes, there are only so many resources. So is there anything private here? Nope, nothing private here. So I'm running the command top on cs75.net. And this is just a list of all of the uh, processes that are current running on the server. So the interesting ones for now are at the top right, load average. So 0 0.31, 0 0.22, 0 0.18, these are measurements taken over the past several minutes, three different times. Um, below 1 is good. If it's at 1.0, it essentially means you're using 100% of a CPU. So these low numbers are good. So when a server is being hammered by many, many different web browsers, what happens ultimately is that that load starts to go high. But that's just a measurement. It doesn't mean anything into itself. But what you see on each of the rows here that we have a whole bunch of processes running on this server. We've got Apache, which is a web server. Uh, and actually, the processes are on the right-hand side. HTTPD is the server. Um, MySQLD is the database server. We've got POP3 and SASL and some other stuff for mail enabled. It's not publicly accessible. We just use it locally behind a firewall. Um, SSHD is an SSH daemon. So the relevant one here is going to be either the MySQLD or HTTPD. So when you spawn a typical web server, web servers these days are multi-threaded, which means they listen for multiple connections simultaneously. Unfortunately, they can only handle so many connections at once. So if your, hammer, your server is getting hammered, so to speak, that means that you're trying to funnel hundreds or thousands of requests into just a handful of Linux processes or Linux threads, and they get backed up. The operating system has to buffer them, and even these buffers are only so large. So in short, and somewhat non-technically, bad things start to happen when the server is overloaded beyond what it's designed to handle. And so the end result is that performance gets degraded for almost anyone. So if you ever have a server that's slash dotted, where you've published something on a web and someone on slash dot links to you and thousands of people rush to your server at once, you're simply overtaxing the CPU, or specifically uh, asking each of these threads or these processes to each do more than they're they're designed to handle. And so that, that's the part I get confused by. Like, why doesn't the server, so the server can't elegantly reject all the ones that it can't handle? So it, it can. Um, the server can start to reject certain connections, but most pieces of software will try to handle all of them. And typically, if you want that kind of filtration, you would do it at a different layer. Like, you would have the router or the nearby firewall or some other third, uh, third uh, external device do some kind of throttling or rate limitation on your server. Or load balancers, which we'll also talk about in the next two weeks, is another way of mitigating this. Yeah? So each one of those HTTP are those individual sessions? So These are. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, so you, Apache by default forks off multiple threads to handle incoming requests. So we ran the, the startup script for Apache once, and based on various configuration settings, it decided to be able to field six or so connections simultaneously. Um, even though that's relatively low, handling a connection takes only milliseconds, if that. So they are actually each able to multitask fairly efficiently.
Exactly. This is just the number of, pro of uh, Apache instances that happen to be running, have threads that happen to be running right now, listening to port 80. And things are just moving around, partly by chance. And it's possible someone's hitting the server, but the load is so relatively low that we don't notice anything really interesting here. But worrisome signs, and if you're a, an aspiring sysadmin or just someone who cares about learning this stuff, um, the interesting numbers here, again, tend to be this, these ones. But the more interesting question is, why is my load so high? And that's usually because the top several threads here or processes are taking up much and much and much of your CPU. So we run into this. So frankly, this class here where the students write things in C and are writing a code on our server simultaneously, hundreds of students at a time. I mean, we see, until we imposed resource limits a few weeks ago, students who accidentally wrote infinite loops or just really bad code, you know, practically took down the server several times because they were churning through so many CPU cycles um, until we said, no, you're each capped at a certain level, which we don't like to do, but it was the only way to protect it for everyone else. Uh, yeah. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, so I don't think I've used console. I've used net today. Okay, so under net, I then click on the URL and then I expand this. Is that what you were looking for? It's the net tab. And you might have to reload with the net tab open. So another little, little firebug trick for the day. And yeah. Oh, absolutely. So you could send AJAX requests only optionally if, you, sure. And that would just be some JavaScript code that just checks the value of various CSS properties, just like we did to t show and hide the progress bar in an example a week or two ago. You can just check, is that style property block or is it none? Or, or, if, or if, uh, the window is not visible. Ah, is, if, can you check if the window is not visible? Um, not really. You can determine with JavaScript uh, where the user has scrolled to, but for the most part, you're sandboxed in a browser. And for instance, you can't determine via JavaScript if the window has been minimized or something like that. And you certainly can't detect if the person is just not paying attention to it. It's just not um, <laughs> possible in this version of JavaScript. Other questions? Yep. Well, one of the things I find interesting is I'm used to just always refreshing things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not used to having things just change all the time. Okay. Um, other than Yahoo Sports, which I ended up looking at, I'm trying to have the Thirty and Six thing. So it, it does seem like it's coming up with a different approach. It's like, hmm, I, I start starting to worry about when people start changing things on me in the in the background. Sure. So a couple of answers. And for the camera, the concern is you're used to refreshing pages proactively, not having things automatically change on you. Um, I would, so I'll, I'll use the cliche, I think you're dating yourself with regard to the internet because, and I mean that playfully only because. <laughs> That's okay. So it's increasingly common. And when you look, so I spent, our, granted, we have the luxury for a site like this of knowing our audience being 18-something-year-old students who are completely attuned to Facebook automatically updating itself, Twitter automatically updating itself, and so forth. Um, but the upside for, for other demographics, too, or just other users with different um, sort of mental models for websites is, sure, go ahead and reload the page. We don't care. It's still going to work the same. Now, we're spending unnecessarily CPU cycles on you every five seconds. Um, and maybe there's a downside to updating the dates and times if you were kind of expecting it not to change. Um, hopefully, the, it's a net positive, though, in this particular use case. It's, it's just, it, it, as it gets more and more out there, this is OK. This I can maybe understand. But if things start, more things start changing, I like it. I think you got to ready yourself, because uh, <laughs> no, in all seriousness. It, if, um, no, especially if you've paid attention in any uh, one to like the news about Google and Chrome OS or Chromium OS, where they're really trying to move the world away from Windows, which I think will die off of that model of client-side computing, 
will probably personally die off eventually because it's just so much easier and cheaper to maintain stuff centrally in the cloud or centrally. I mean, I definitely think the trend over the next 10 years will be back to the thin client model, which I am happy to embrace because I'm sick and tired of maintaining multiple computers and multiple operating systems. I just as soon outsource that. The interesting challenges are obviously, and we'll discuss this in a week or two, is you know, well, now I have to trust Google or Amazon or whomever with all of my data. Even still, I don't like using, uh, I stopped using Microsoft Money years ago when they mandated that I had, when the next version required that I store all my bank account info, not locally in a file, but on their MSN servers. Um, fortunately, I changed to Quicken, which sucks more. Um, <laughs> but um, but websites like Mint.com are you know very much in vogue. Actually, this is a bit of a tangent, and I was also very disheartened to learn recently that Mint.com, was a, which is supposedly very popular, I've not used it myself because I was never comfortable enough, but was apparently just bought by Intuit, which is the sucky company that makes Quicken. So I now am still back to square one. Um, it's still pretty good. Mint.com, all right, because Quicken's still pretty bad. No, I've actually, as a complete tangent, wondered just how many millions of dollars their bugs cost the federal government or taxpayers, because I've certainly encountered bugs in TurboTax myself, which is another one of their products. And that's fascinatingly scary when you multiply a dollar mistake, a hundred dollar mistake across their thousands or millions of customers. So anyhow, don't use Intuit products. <laughs> yeah. It'll be... I'll be the one who's defaulting on my taxes, I'm sure. Yeah, no, that's the tragedy, but, um, yeah. Yeah, but the idea of the government finding a bug is... No, that, that's true, too. The odds of them finding it, but still. Um, the, yeah. Anyhow, stay away from Intuit. Um, though, uh, please rec email me personally with recommendations for alternatives, because I'm still stuck on Quicken. Um, anyhow, we're losing sight of the lecture. So Ajax <laughs> ultimately is about automatically integrating data seamlessly into one's website. We've seen three different approaches with JSON, with Ajax, and even with inner HTML and just shipping back uh, XHTML. And the hope with, again, final projects is to take one or two or three or any of the ideas in this course and really want, run with it. And I would urge you to play around, look around at APIs that exist. I would talk to folks at work or just think to yourself you know, what actual problems exist or if you just like learning new things and want to learn a PHP template library or jQuery or some library, the final project is all opportunity for stuff like that. So in a few weeks' time, uh, we'll all have some cake in the computer science building. We'll exhibit all of your projects. We'll meet with the digital photography class. But what remains on the agenda is a uh, uh, class on security. And we'll discuss in much greater detail all the upsides and downsides of the design decisions we've, making, we've been making and scalability. When you actually have a few hundred, a few thousand, or lucky yet, uh, millions of users, how can you actually deal with that and do you have to change fundamentally how you code or can you throw hardware or money at it? We'll look at both approaches. So why don't we end a few minutes early here. I'll stick around and Sid will be here in about 10 minutes across the hallway for the last, the very last section.